Okay. Welcome to this 51st colloquium of this series, PRL Ka Amrut Vyakhyam. And uh, I must uh, tell that uh, this is a fantastic series so far we have, and thanks to Nandita and Anirji for actually, and, and the whole team actually bringing in very illustrious speakers, uh, not just from physics and like today's speaker, I mean, we had uh, speakers from various branches of uh, uh, intellectual excellence. And uh, uh, this is a part of the uh, series called PRL Ka Amrut Vyakhyan to mark the 75th year of our independence and also 75th year of PRL. PRL started uh, in 1947 also. So we, we had a lot of uh, uh, interesting, fantastic talks to, and, and uh, like uh, today I look forward to, and uh, we are uh, actually lucky to have Mr. Luis Miranda, um, ISPP International, sorry, yeah, is it International School of Public Policy? And or it's Indian School of Public Policy, ISPP, I know it very well. Uh, um, and, and he is the co-founder of it. And uh, thanks, Jerry, for taking the initiative in, in, in uh, bringing him, making him have a total agreeing to give a colloquium here. Uh, and the title is uh, very, very interesting. Uh, uh, like how, how one can create one's own luck and one's own networking and, and one, one can use it. Uh, so I, I, I request uh, Professor Janardhan to give a formal introduction to the speaker. Professor Janardhan. Um, well, thank you, Hiranmai. And um, Nandita and uh, Ushit and others on this panel today. And a very good afternoon to everybody who are attending this uh, talk. In this uh, Diamond Jubilee year of PRL, uh, as Hiran Mayer has already said, we will be through a series of 75 lectures by very eminent personalities who have contributed to nation building, be honoring the memory of Vikram Sarabhai, who not only founded PRL, but whose vision led to, among others, many, very many other things, India's space program, which now touches and changes for the better the lives of 1.3 billion Indians, about 15% of the global population. Something to ponder about whenever we think of the contributions of Professor Sarabhai. So on an occasion such as this, it is therefore a great privilege and honor for me to introduce today's or to today's audience, my classmate from St. Joseph's Boys High School, Bangalore, my friend of nearly five decades, Luis Miranda, who is currently the chairman and co-founder of the Indian School of Public Policy, which is the country's first school of public policy that is focused on governance reforms rather than economic reforms. You know, a vast majority of people can be described quite simply uh, by the profession they are in, for example, astronomer, solar physicist, doctor, pilot, banker, and so on. But Luis Miranda is an exception. He is a multi-talented, multifaceted personality and wears many hats. One could describe him in many ways as an entrepreneur, a chartered accountant, an investment banker, a venture capitalist, or a founder of institutions, having been the one, one of the founders of HDFC, a CEO. He was the CEO of IDFC, private equity, which he was also involved in creating. He's a teacher. He teaches a course at the Booth School of Business in Chicago, a blogger. And I would recommend that all of you follow some of his blogs in Forbes and Spontaneous Order for his very sharp and unique insights into a variety of topics that affect us all. In addition, he's also an athlete. He has played rugby at the club and national level for several years. He's a philanthropist having pledged to give away half of what he has to charity. And he's a mentor for Catholic youth in Mumbai to get them more involved in activities of the church. After schooling in Bangalore, he moved to Bombay to do his BCom, 
which he obtained in 1982. Following this, he did a CA working at Pricewaterhouse in between 1982 and 86. And Pricewaterhouse, as we all know, is one of the big four consulting firms in the world. He then took a year off from academics and worked for KPMG, Dubai, uh, between 1986 and 87. And KPMG is another one of the big four companies. And after that, he shifted to the world-renowned Wood School of Business at Chicago, which, you know, since its inception, uh, since the inception of the Nobel Prize in Economy, Economics, has produced nine Nobel laureates, the last being in 2017, and three Nobel laureates currently are on its faculty. He obtained an MBA in uh, between, he did an MBA between 1987 and 89 from the Booth School at Chicago. And while there, he received the Dean's Award for Distinction for helping develop the only compulsory course taught at Booth School today. He returned to India in 1989 and worked for a decade in Treasury, Citibank, HSBC, HDFC, before embarking on testing his entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial skills by helping found HDFC and IDFC equity. I could go on and on, but time is of essence today. So with this brief introduction, let me thank Luis Miranda for having found time from his hectic, hectic daily schedule to talk to us today, and I invite him now to deliver his talk entitled Luck and Networking, how it can help you. The floor is yours, Luis. Thank you, Janadan, my friend of 50 years. Makes us all sound so old, eh? but uh, <laughs> but we are old, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but you made me sound so good, yet. And I also want to thank Kiran Maya <laughs> and uh, Nandita for this chance to speak today and congratulations to PRL on 75 years. It's been fascinating. Uh, the, the, the legacy has been the cradle of space science in India. The physical research laboratory is fabulous. And as the country celebrates 75 years, so do you guys. So when Janathan asked me initially, Lewis, can you speak? I said, what am I going to do with a bunch of scientists? I didn't know what I could say. So I said, I want to talk about something which is off the wall. And uh, just because, you know, I've, uh, I was never the smart guy in the room. Janathan and all were much smarter than we in class. But, uh, but I've learned over the years that uh, you need to have certain other sort of things to help you along the way. Uh, one of them is being able to connect the dots and network. And the other thing is just to have a lot of luck. So, uh, so, so that's really what uh, I think is... Uh, is, is what we've uh, got to talk about today. Uh, there are three parts to, to what I'm going to be saying. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, my story and the lessons learned. I've also, over the last few days, been told repeatedly that there's a difference between causation and correlation. So whatever I say happened with me doesn't mean that it's going to happen to other people. But that's some of the tools that I've learned from my own experiences and how one can take that forward. And uh, because I'm dealing with a bunch of research people, scientists, I was sort of, I was told that in research writing and academic writing, you sort of lay out the various points and at the end comes the comments on what the conclusion is. So we look at that. Uh, and you know, this, this issue of, you know, the things that I'll talk about today, does that apply to everyone? No. It's just my story of how things helped me get to where I am today. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Outliers, where he said that people who become great have spent 10,000 hours. That's the magical number of working on it. So uh, Bill Gates spent 10,000 hours understanding programming and then became this rich guy at Microsoft. Similarly, uh, this golfer was it's a better say I just blank out on his name. He was a great golfer. He spent 10,000 hours practicing and he became great. But uh, but that doesn't mean that if you didn't spend 10,000 hours, you will not be great. Nor does it tell you that if you spend 10,000 hours, you may not also be great. Uh, and I go back to a course that I took with a with a philosopher called Yuval Harari, a scientist, a social scientist. 
And he said when he started the course that I'm going to be talking about things that happened 70,000 years ago. There was no history written at that time. I can't prove that I'm right, nor can you prove that I'm wrong. So just sit back and listen to a different point of view. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about my story. It goes back to 1976. I finished school with Janadan. Uh, and uh, I did my BCom. Why? Because my dad told me to do so. I did my CA after that. Why? Because my dad told me to do so. I was a good son. And then I did my MBA. Again, why? Because my dad told me to do so. And then I, in 89, I got an offer to come back to India and work uh, with Citibank. It was not the job that I was looking for. I went for that interview to New York only because it was a free trip to New York. And I uh, met this chap called Jaidev Ayer who talked about this fantastic job, which, uh, which, I, could, uh, which, which, he, which I could use. And uh, it paid me peanuts. I was the lowest paid guy in my graduating class. And people told me that I was crazy to come back to India. Now, why did Jaidev offer me this job? Because he had spoken to people who he had worked, who I'd worked with in the summer, and we therefore knew common people. And he was told that I'm a good guy and I should sort of join. And uh, I came back to India. People said I was crazy. This was before Manmohan Singh came and opened up the economy. Then in 94, I had enough of working in multinationals. And I decided that I'm going instead to, uh, I, got an, uh, I got a call one day from, again, someone senior who I used to know earlier. And he said, Lewis, we're starting a bank. Would you be interested? And, uh, and I said, uh, sure. And, uh, and people said, you're crazy. How can you leave a foreign bank to join an Indian bank? And uh, I came on board and uh, the bank we started was HDFC Bank. And today it is the most valuable bank in the country. We never thought it would be like this 25 years ago, nearly 28 years ago when we started it. But that's sort of where the bank ended up. And again, people said, Lewis, you're crazy. You can't leave a foreign bank and, and you know, join an Indian bank. Similarly, in 2000, I left the bank. I decided that I was intrigued by the dot-com bubble. The crash had already happened. And I was leaving valuable options on the table. And I decided to join a small venture fund. I was there for two years. I left a lot. I lost a lot of money because I didn't sort of take my vested options. And then I got a chat. And, and then two years later, I reached out to one of my mentors. Deepak Parikh, and I told him, Deepak, I'm looking to do something on the development side. And he says, come and meet me tomorrow. So I go to meet him the next day, and he tells me, Lewis, we've got a mandate from the government to set up an infrastructure fund. Why don't you set it up and run it? And I said, it sounds good. I always wanted to do something like this on my, in my free time. Now I do it full time, and I get paid. Only two problems. One, I've never made an investment in my life. And two, I knew nothing about infrastructure. And here was I setting up India's largest infrastructure fund at that time. Uh, again, people said, you're crazy. How can you can't make money investing in infrastructure? You can't raise money to invest in infrastructure. And, uh, and I had no idea what I was coming for. All I knew was that the infrastructure was really bad. And uh, if we didn't work on improving it, We'd, uh, everyone's going to, this company, this country is going to go down. So we would figure out a way uh, that, you know, we, we can get this to work. And then in 2010, after proving that we can, and in 2009, we got uh, awarded the best infrastructure asset manager in Asia. Uh, in 2010, I had enough. Our kids at that time were 13 and 15. And I said, before they go off to college, let me stay at home and traumatize them. So I stayed at home and traumatized them. I'm a terrible father that way. And uh, then again, fast forward to 2018. I, uh, together with, with a friend of mine, Part Shah, we started the Indian School of Public Policy with the aim of democratizing public policy training in the country. 
and uh, to build state capacity. And again, people said, you're crazy. You can't sort of set up a school within one year. You can't sort of, you know, where were the jobs? How will you build it out? And we said, we will figure it out. We just graduated our third batch. And, uh, and we said, and, you know, and it's people have been good. I want to share a couple of slides to, uh, to sort of just show you some of the things that I want to talk about. So, Janathan, you, since you like Calvin, I'm sort of showing you Calvin. So, Ke life always looks terrible. You know, we have this situation when we're sort of looking at stuff and we feel that we, we really can't manage it. Life's unbearable. But there's always opportunities that come across. And, uh, and I'm sort of reminded of uh, Forrest Gump. I don't know how many of you remember seeing the movie Forrest Gump. Tom Hanks was acting in the movie. And he's there with this box and he's carrying, selling chocolates. And he said, Mama said that life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get until you bite into it, you know? So, and he sat on the bench and he was telling people who walked by throughout the movie what his whole life story was about. And, and if you look at it, my story was a lot like his. A lot of things that happened to me were because somebody else came and told me this. I didn't want to come there. I hadn't planned on coming back to India in 89. Someone came and Jaidev Vyar came into my life and said, come back to India. I didn't think that I'd be setting up a bank in India, an Indian bank. The word startup didn't exist in 1994. Entrepreneurship was not this word that people talked about. And yet, in 94, I get a call from Bharat Shah. And uh, we start HDFC Bank. And then I go to Deepak Parik and... Uh, I start IDFC, uh, you know, private equity. And then he suggests that to me. And then, you know, part Shah, I just suddenly realized a lot of these ideas came from Gujaratis in my life. Yeah? Part Shah, Deepak Parekh, uh, uh, Bharat Shah, et cetera. So, so uh, you know, so a lot of these ideas came. So, so I sort of said, you know, I am Boris Gum. So I asked my daughter, can she just sort of morph this out and put my, this is the closest I've been to having a body like Tom Hanks. She just sort of, sort of photoshopped my head onto that. And you know, cause my life is a lot like, uh, like, like, like Forrest Gump, which is that life things happen by accident. So, so what's the story behind this? What, what, what are the lessons learned from this? One, be crazy. Do the stuff that people say cannot be done. So I'm sure that Vikram Sarabhai was told in 1947, you're mad, you can't set up a laboratory in Ahmedabad to do this. And he did it. And you guys are now living proof of the success of it. Similarly, you know, people told me you're crazy to come back to India in 89. You're crazy to leave a foreign bank job. You're crazy to walk away from stock options that are very valuable. You're crazy to try to think you can make money investing in infrastructure. You're an idiot to quit working at the, stop working at the age of 48. I did all of that and I was lucky. So it's, so the first lesson I guess is being crazy, be crazy. And then now comes back to the point of what's the downside whenever you're crazy. And that's something which is important for people to understand. I've got the sign over here. In the end, we only regret the chances we didn't take. And, and you know, and it's important to keep that in mind because it's not about the money we made or the stuff we did. People regret, what did I not do? So don't have those regrets. On average, we're going to live till at least 75. So when I came back to India, I was saying, you know, am I, going, am I doing the right thing? In 89, it wasn't fashionable to come back to India. But I came back and my thought process at that time was, if things didn't work out, I could always go back. I'd lose maybe two, three years of my life. But when you're looking at a 75-year life, Two, three years doesn't make much of a difference. Similarly, when I, le when I left Citibank and I said, we're going to start a new bank, HDFC Bank, what happens if the bank fails? Okay, I'll come back and I'll figure out something else to do. Similarly with IDFC, what happens if you can't raise a fund? What happens if the fund doesn't do well in infrastructure? Okay, I lose two, three years of my life. But also remember, when you try something which doesn't work out, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've you may have lost money or something like that, but you never lost experiences. The experiences you get make you so much better in life. So, so that's the sort of part about, you know, uh, about being crazy.
But there's another thing which is also very important, which is purpose. Everything that I did had to have a purpose. Uh, this is a neon sign which is there at my business school in Booth. Why are you here and not somewhere else? And that's a question which I tell people, you got to ask yourself this question every three months, every six months or whatever, you figure out the time frame at, at the physical research laboratory. Ask yourself this question, why am I here and not somewhere else? It helps validate the reason for you to think about why you came here in the first place. You came here with a vision, you wanted to study uh, solar and use, you know, become an expert on solar telescopes and work over there on a dipole. You've done it for so many years, but you sometimes get frustrated with the routine work or dealing with the bureaucracy or having, in your case, at least you've had water throughout the time when you've been over there in that lake. But, but the fact is that, you know, you've, you, 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 we have, we have a lot of challenges in our lives. And when you ask yourself that question, why am I here and not somewhere else? It reestablishes the fact that you had a purpose to be here and that purpose is retained. So what is the purpose of coming back to India? I said that, hey, first of all, I mean, let's be clear. I came back to India because I couldn't get a decent job in the US, which was exciting. I got paid a lot more, but the jobs weren't exciting. The most exciting job was the job which paid me peanuts in India. But I came back because I said that if I wanted to do something, eventually I'm going to be back in India, so I might as well come back earlier. That was the purpose. Setting up HDFC Bank, what is the purpose? We wanted to show the world that we can set up an Indian bank that we can all be proud of, which can serve middle-class India. It's a separate point that it became very valuable, et cetera. And the share price did very well. But that was never the reason for starting HDFC Bank. And then when we started IDFC Private Equity, the purpose was really to say, we want to basically improve the quality of infrastructure in India and prove that you can make money investing in infrastructure. And we did it. Similarly, with the Indian School of Public Policy, we want to democratize public policy education in the country, and we want to build our state capacity. And that's what we're working on. So that purpose in life is very important. So, so that's the second thing you don't want to look at. Being crazy and whatever you do, it's got to have a purpose. Then we look at uh, the next one, which is uh, last Saturday, we had the convocation at the Indian School of Public Policy. And I was talking to the graduates, uh, the graduate students, and I told them, you know, we've we graduated, you guys are graduating, graduated now. 90% of the class have already got jobs and the salaries they're earning is more than the cost of the program. And the previous year, the number was 55% on graduation. The previous year is only 25% on graduation. So you guys have done well and we've all been, you know, uh, and you know, and, and you should all be proud of it. So what are the lessons we've learned from the fact that a lot of y'all are placed? One, we've got a great placement team. So that's what the, the first lesson. And, uh, but that's not enough because the placement team can only place people if they are good. So the second reason, lesson is that all the, the, the scholars we have who got placed were all fabulous people, which is why we could place and get them all jobs uh, before they graduated. Uh, and also because we've got fabulous faculty over there to be able to train them so that, you know, we've got this great team. But that's also not, not enough. There has to be something else. And the third lesson really is luck. You know, for, there are some people on our team who, uh, in our school, who had spent many years trying to sit for the UPSC examination and join the IAS, and they didn't get through. And sometimes they work very hard, but sometimes it's just luck that you know, they, they were not able to go through and someone else got through, or they got a job just now and someone else didn't get a job, or they got into ISPP and someone else didn't get in. I, for example, as I've told you before, was a terrible student. Uh, before, uh, in 1976, when we, uh, three months before we had our uh, final ICSE examination, we had something called Michaelmas exam or something like that. It was like, it's like a preliminary exam. And, uh, and I failed in three subjects. So my parents flew me home to Bombay. I was in boarding school in Bangalore. 
And I was given this pep talk that unless I got my life together, I'd be a failure, etc. I was sent to a student counselor, etc. And I and I managed to get through the examination uh, decently. But I was never the top student. And suddenly in my C exam, which is a very tough examination, I get an all India rank, both in the intermediate and in the final examination. The person who was shocked the most was me. But but to me, it was again, I, there was just some lucky. And then I was doing my MCOM examination, my master's in commerce. And I did it only because I could qualify for those 16 years of formal education you require for a master's program in the US. So my first year, I never really studied. I didn't attend classes. And I came third in the university. I still today don't know how what happened. And uh, I just put it down to luck. So I said to myself, if I didn't study and I came third in the university, why don't I study and take it seriously in my second year? And I can come first. I'll be a gold medalist. So I took it seriously. I studied and then I failed. So, so to me, it was a classic case of, you know, luck played an important role. And similarly, when I look at my own life over here, I've talked about how I, I just had a chance to meet up with Jaydev Ayer. I decided I will land up in New York for that interview, and that changed my life. Similarly, the, the, when HDFC Bank was starting and Aditya Puri was sort of building out the, the bank, one of the first people, he said, okay, let's call Lewis. He's a young guy. You know, he's, he's very enthusiastic. Maybe he'll be excited in this. So, I, got, so I, got, I was lucky to have been called as opposed to somebody else being called for that role. Similarly, with IDFCP, I was extremely lucky over here because there were two other people they talked to before I landed up on the scene. And both those people thought this was a very stupid idea. So I just happened to be the only idiot who said yes to that job and I took it. And we proved ourselves extremely successful to be the best infrastructure fund in the world at that time. So luck is an important role. So I was telling the students over here today uh, on Saturday, that you know, we were, you're all over here because of luck. You, it's a lot of hard work, a lot of sort of you know, effort you'll have put in, but there's also an element of luck. And because you're lucky, you have a responsibility to those who are not that lucky. Why is it that you're sit, we are sitting over here, I'm sitting in this lovely room having a talk with you, and there are hundreds of other people who should be also talking to PR over their experiences. I just happened to be lucky because Janathan and I went to school together. And that's why I'm sitting here talking to you. And I'm lucky. And there could be someone else who didn't go to school with any of you guys on, in the leadership and therefore didn't get a chance to come and talk over here. So we owe a responsibility to the people who are not that lucky, who either you know, were born into the wrong family or didn't get a chance to get the right education or had some major tragedy in their life. We owe a responsibility to them to be able to help them and compensate for the fact that we were lucky and we had that chance. So, so then people tell me, Lewis, okay, that's fine. You were lucky. You keep talking about luck. How do you create luck? So I said, I have no idea. So I go back to Google and I Google, how do people get luck? So I came across this lesson of four habits of lucky people by Richard Wiseman, who clearly is a wise man, but he studied at, you know, he taught at the University of Hertfordshire. I have no idea where it is, but he came up with these four points about uh, uh, what four habits of lucky people. One, maximize chance opportunities. If you do the same thing every day, you go the same way to work, you eat the same food, you sit, have lunch with the same people, you go back the same way you do, you play with cricket on Saturday with the same people, you will never have the opportunity to meet someone new. So his point was maximize chance open. Take a different route, sit down with someone else for lunch, play cricket with some other team, go for a walk, meet people. On my walk, I'll see these people and after seeing them for four days, four days in a row, smiling at them, I'll stop one day and say, hi, I'm Lewis, what's your name? And we met some interesting people this way. So maximize chance opportunities. The second is listen to your gut instinct. So we all are taught we've got to analyze, we've got to think, we've got to do all of that. It's important to listen to what your gut says. What does your heart say also? You know, what do you feel about it and go with it? Third is expect to be lucky. 
So you go in with that element of positivity and be happy about it. And the fourth thing he talked about is find the good in anything. But whenever it's even something goes bad, what is it that we can learn from it? What can we do? Sorry, I'm back again to Calvin over here. So luck's a very important part of life. But that again doesn't explain how I got all those chances around in my, in my life. And, and I come back to sort of the lesson that what does all this mean? It all means that, you know, life is full of these possibilities, but how do you connect it? Why, for example, did I meet up with a Jaide wire? Why did Jaide wire take to me five minutes into the interview? Why did Varachan Aditya Puri call me and say, let's start HDFC Bank? Why did Deepak Parikh say, Louis, why don't you start IDFCP? Why did, you know, someone, Ajesha introduced me to Parcha and therefore I got involved with ISPP. What caused all these sort of triggers over there? And that's something which, which I call networking. And, and I was sort of, many years ago, I was taking part in a 25 kilometer beach walk, 55 kilometer beach walk in Goa. So we were doing these preparatory walks. And I, and I was asked by a friend of mine, Lois, can you come and talk to my colleagues about how do you stay in touch with people? Now you've been able to build up relationships over a long period of time. How do you do it? My colleagues look at every relationship as a transactional. So I said, sure, I'll do that. And then I went home and I suddenly realized, what am I going to talk about to these, these people? Because I have no idea. I don't have a framework. I, 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 uh, I, I do what I do. It just comes automatically. So I asked my wife, you know, what, why don't you just tell me about the things that you observe me doing? And then, you know, and then sort of, you know, and let's see whether I can get some idea what to talk to these consultants about. So he did. So she, so she did. So she talked to me about all of this. And, and these are the sort of the six characteristics that came about into my model of networking. And I said it differs with different people. But to me, it was these six points. One is pos the importance of positivity with networking. Second is a hard work, third is openness, fourth is reliance, fifth is consequences, and then you have empathy. And I came up with this, these letters so I can come up with a very stupid acronym called FORCE. But, but the purpose of this was really to say uh, what this is. So what, so what do each of these, these things mean for us? So the first one is on positivity. It's, it's important to sort of, when, you, when you're reaching out to people, that you know you you expect I, I'm calling somebody because I know that person's going to respond because your body language will sort of reflect that. Years ago, one of my uh, professors, a guy called Marvin Zonis, he wasn't well. Uh, sorry, he, he had uh, we decided to set up a scholarship in his name uh, to fund a foreign student to come to Chicago and at Booth and and uh, and study for two years. Sorry, someone from, uh, from an emerging market. And one year there was this lady Mira from TFI in Teach for India in Pune who got the scholarship. And then before she left, I told Mira, Mira, when you land up in Chicago, send Marvin an email and tell him you're here. Uh, she didn't. And, uh, in Mar and, and about three weeks later, Marvin Zonas professor sends her an email saying, young lady, you must have settled in. Why don't you, uh, why don't we meet up for lunch? So a few days later, they met up for lunch. They spent three hours over lunch. And at the end of it, Mira told Marvin, you know, Lewis told me that I should reach out to you. But I couldn't figure out why would a senior professor want to meet a young student like me? And he told her, Mira, life is complicated enough. Don't complicate it more by negotiating against yourself. Think about how many times you did reach out to somebody because you said that person will not reply. What's the worst that can happen? You lose five minutes of your life by writing a letter or an email. That's all. What's the worst that can happen? The person doesn't reply. You're not going to die. But if that person was to reply, you could have a different path totally. So quite often we negotiate against ourselves because of the negativity we have internally. So positivity is a very important part about it. The second thing is hard work. 
uh, we all sort of, you know, think that, you know, networking is this easy thing, but it's not. So this phone that I have is, is an extremely uh, important networking tool. Because when I meet somebody, I put down over there in the notes section information about them. So I would say, for example, with Nandita, you would have listed over there about the work that you do in Udaipur, with Janadhan, I'll have his family name, et cetera. So now when I meet Janadhan the next time, I'll say, you know, by the way, you know, how's, you know, I, I would sort of refer to his wife by her name, I would refer to his daughter, et cetera. And he would say, wow, this guy, Lewis, is extremely, he remembers all of this. So I don't have a terrible memory, but I have taken the effort to note it down over here. And that's why I have all that information around here. So it's, it's taking the notes over there to do so. Uh, my first lesson actually in networking was given to me by my father about how Aristotle or Nassus, that Greek tycoon, would take notes about this. The second thing uh, we also do in terms of working hard is, is meeting people. So when I, for example, am going to New York in September, I've already made a list of people. I search on my phone again, all the people in New York or around New York, people who I haven't met for a long time. And I tell them, listen, I'm going to be around over here. Let's meet up and, and, and stay in touch with people. Sometimes it's, 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 you know, you haven't met them for a long time, reach out to them. Before meeting anybody, I would check their LinkedIn profile or Google them to understand has there been something that they've done where we can set up a connection uh, especially if I'm meeting somebody for the first time. So that, that's required about you know, using the system to be able to do so. Trust is very important. You've got to trust people and treat them as people who are, are good people. Otherwise, you will never build up relationships with people. Using humor, we're very serious about it. I have Calvin on my slides. You know, so it's important to, to use humor and be grateful to people. Thank them, appreciate them. Because that's how you build relationships with, with people. Then comes openness. Openness is about believing that you may not always be right. We live in this world today which is very polarized. You're either a Modi supporter or you're a Modi hater. You're either sort of, you know, anti-abortion or pro-abortion. And you know, everyone is on this extreme. And if you... And you can't sort of agree with people on certain topics. You have to agree with them on everything or disagree with them on everything. And, and that's become a challenge today in this world that, you know, people aren't willing to realize or appreciate the fact that there could be another point of view. Or they could be, or you could be wrong. And therefore being open to, the, to this is, is an important sort of way about, about building relationships. We've talked already about trust and you know relying on people. Consequences. Quite often when something goes bad, when something goes good, it's because of us. When something goes bad, it's because of somebody else. That's another way how you can destroy relationships. The moment you take responsibility for consequences of your actions, whether it's good or bad, you build up better networks. And finally, empathy. You've got to care for people. If you don't care for people, you cannot build up relationships. So this is my force model. It's something that works for me. It's just, it's something that I've you know unconsciously been working on for a long time, and it's worked for me you know over the years. And uh, since I was talking at PRL, I had to end up with something which has to do with space. So this is a line from Star Wars: "May the force be with you." And uh, yep, so that's my story. About being crazy, I didn't talk much about hard work because you guys work anyway hard, but hard work's very important. Luck and networking. That's my sort of story over here. And uh, uh, I'm trying to figure out how I can stop this. What happened here? Uh, how do I, I think I pressed the wrong thing. Yeah. So, so that's my that's my story. Andita, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Luis. It was a wonderful journey, and I'm sure uh, most of us have gone through this journey uh, and uh, in our own individual paths, we have taken different uh, ways, but I think we can all uh, share the same thoughts, but it's wonderful to hear from you. And as Janadan pointed out in the beginning, that you wear many hats and we have seen through your journey that you really have taken up the right opportunities at the right time. And that's the biggest lesson for us. Uh, I think I'll call upon Vineet because you have very less time to be with us. Um, so I'll call upon Vineet to uh, conduct the question and answer session. Um, Vineet, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Luis, for such a wonderful talk. And uh, especially your last slide uh, on Kylo and Darth, that was really <laughs> interesting. And the message that uh, may the force be with you, that was really uh, good and interesting to watch because I'm, I'm a very big uh, Star Wars fan to so <laughs> look at that way. Okay, so now we will start the question and answer session. So what I will do is that uh, we will have question and answer from our YouTube audience and uh, the audience on WebEx as well. So I will first upon call uh, invite our WebEx audience to ask their question directly to you. They can raise their hand and uh, they can directly ask the questions. To us. Yep. So, Okay, so uh, there, there's a hand raised by uh, Professor Janada. So you can go ahead and ask the question. Louis, while I was uh, looking up various things about, uh, you know, economics and things, because I was introducing you, I came across a lot of this behavioral economics. What exactly is that? I mean, I know it's not uh, connected directly with what you've said, but in a way, I mean, I know that the stock market and things can be influenced by the way that people behave, but is it a science? I mean, can you? So, you know, so I, I went to the uh, University of Chicago, which, which, you know, which built out this lot of theories about, about behavior, about efficient markets and, uh, and you know, and, and, and why things, people are rational. And a lot of economic theory was based, therefore, on those ideas of the people are rational, markets are efficient, and therefore, when A happens, when, when there's something like A, then B will happen, etc. And some of my professors at Chicago, people like Gary Becker, George Stigler, Gene Farmer, all who won Nobel Prizes, uh, talked about that. And then there were these behavioral economists, like uh, the guy who was there, but people like Richard Taylor, et cetera, who came and said, people don't behave rationally. Markets aren't efficient. And therefore, uh, that you, know, you need to also account for the fact that people behave differently. They all don't behave the same way. And so behavioral economics really studies the effects of psychological, cultural, social effects on the way people take decisions. And, uh, and, that, and that's really what is done. So initially when they came up with the fact that people don't behave rationally, uh, they were laughed at. And they were told like, you just are sort of, you know, talking about anecdotal stories, but in, 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 in large, you don't have it. But over time, it, uh, it sort of developed into the fact that it's become a regular stream. At the Indian School of Public Policy, we teach behavioral economics because it's important to understand that people behave differently. Uh, but at the same time, I think they all look at data, they look at information, how they process it can be done differently because people analyze and look at things differently. But that's really what's happened. And in you know, places like you, Chicago, you have people who've been strong behavioral economists, like Richard Taylor, who won the Nobel Prize. And then you have people who think that it's rubbish and also win the Nobel Prize for their point of view. But that's really what behavioral economics is about. You know, adding elements of economics and psychology to understand better why people behave the way they do. So, and then, you know, what is the consequences of it? So, 
So, I mean, Richard Taylor gives this example of, you know, how do you incentivize people to eat more salad? So you can either reduce the price, etc. But what they found is the most effective way is, is to put salad near your checkout counter. So while you're waiting over there for your for the line to move forward, but to pay for your lunch in the cafeteria, you see the bowl of salad and you pick it up. You know, things like that, you know, things which you know don't are not rational, etc. to think, but that's the way we behave. So that's behavioral economics. Thanks, Louis. It's always sort of tough. You know, it's a, but now we still have questions and everyone's quiet. So thank you for being a good school buddy rather than asking the person. Can I ask something? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah so, yeah, so you can ask a question, but there's a hand raised by Rama uh, before you. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. He can yeah, proceed yeah. and then, uh, okay. Hi, Louis. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, it's also interesting to hear from a person um, who, when he asked, for example, what do you do uh, during your free time? Hey, man, I go and find banks. Um, I have a question. In your entire the course concept, where is this uh, factor called opportunity fitting in? Tell me more about the question. What do you mean by opportunity? So I, I see that, I mean, you had a corollary way saying that uh, uh, we are here where, why we are here or something like that. Yes, correct. So is that is that what you mean by um, the opportunity? Sure. You know, there are two parts to this, and I don't know whether I will address your question correctly. One is, I've realized over time that whatever I've done in the last 33 years since I've graduated, everything, 100% data-based, is because whatever I was successful in doing is because somebody else suggested that. Lewis, why don't you try that? So when people ask me, so Lewis, what's your next plan? I've said, I'm waiting for somebody to tell me. Oh, because yeah. I've realized that whenever I have tried to go out and say, let me try something, I have a hundred percent failure. But whatever has worked out and you know, my whole life has been this exciting thing because I've had these Forrest Gump opportunities thrown at me. So when I look at opportunity, it's really, what are the, uh, what are the sort of, you know, chances, the options given to me by people who know me? So it's not that there was this random person who sort of walking on the street says, hey, you bald guy, why didn't you go set up this infrastructure fund? No, it's somebody who knew me. And, and that's important. You know, how do you build up some of these relationships? I, I have this, I use this great example of someone who is from the IS in Gujarat, a guy called DJ Pandian. Mm -hmm. So I met DJ Pandian way back in 94 when we started HDFC Bank. He was there representing the Ministry of Finance at, mm -hmm. the, uh, at the opening of HDFC Bank. Then I got talking to him. I had no business reason to deal with him. I was in the treasury. He was looking at some, you know, foreign investments in the Ministry of Finance. But whenever I'd go to Delhi, sometimes I would meet up with him and have a cup of chai. Mm -hmm. No business stuff, we just got, became friends. And then he, uh, and I lost touch with him because he moved back to the Gujarat Carter. Fast forward from then to 2003, I've started now IDFC Private Equity. And uh, one of my colleagues brings this investment opportunity to us, Gujarat State Petronet. So, so I said, okay, who's on the board? And I see this name, DJ Pandian. Now it's not a common name. So I said, can you just check up with his office? And it says DJ Pandian, comma, IAS. You know, the, how, many can, how many IAS officers can there be whose name is DJ Pandian? Yeah. So, yeah. so they, so they call back, so he, they call him, my colleague calls up his office and they say, yeah, it's the same person who was at the Ministry of Finance. So I call him up and say, Mr. Pandian, how are you? He said, Lewis, how are you? I said, listen, we're talking about your company. He said, come and meet me. So we ended up being an investor in the company. I was on his board. We went public. Now, you know, and then, and then again, you know, we exited the company and he went on to become chief secretary of Gujarat. 
And uh, I would come here, tell me once to come and talk at the Dean Dayal Petroleum University, and we used to stay in touch again. He then goes and gets in, uh, and then he, I get a call from him one day, Lewis, I've been appointed to be the Chief Investment Officer at the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank in Beijing. Uh, why don't you come and talk to our team about infrastructure? So I said, sure. Will you settle down? Let me know. And then one of my colleagues tells us we were starting a new fund. This is now 2014 at, at Morgan Stanley. And they said, listen, why don't we talk to them about investing in our fund? And then AIB ended up, and Pandian ended up being our first institutional investor in, in our fund. So, so now you look at all these, now what is the opportunity? It's all these <laughs> chance events which would never have happened. AIB had just started off. We were their first fund investment. This is the first connection they had with Morgan Stanley. We, our first investment in a public sector company was when he was a Gujarat State Petronet. That's opportunity. It's these chance things, which, which is luck, network, et cetera, which comes up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Neeraj, you can ask your question directly. Okay. So, first of all, thank you for the nice talk. And among many parts, I like this part, what you were saying, creating your luck. So while creating your luck, there are many factors you were talking about. So one of them could be, which you didn't mention, means could be that perception created by others about you. For example, somebody can say, are you there? I am not able to see on the screen. I, I, I can see, I can see you. I can see, I can hear you. Yep. So somebody can make a perception about you that, oh, if you blew in your team, that then everything is fine. Don't worry anything about that. Or there can be other group of people who can say, oh, Louis, oh, good luck. That way means he can create something negative. So while creating your luck, how you can deal with the people who are creating negative perception of you? So that's important. So I remember when I was a junior person at Citibank uh, way back in 89, and I was trying to do our, uh, Citibank didn't deal with public sector companies at that time. And I was working on one deal with a public sector organization and uh, finally got them to transact with us. And the head of the investment bank sends me an email. Lewis, I always thought you were a useless fellow, but now I finally realized that you can do something. So now I had no idea. This is what his perception was. He thought I was an idiot. He possibly was right also. But, but I, because I did this deal, he suddenly changes his perception about me. It's difficult to change people's perceptions or no. I had no idea this guy thought I was an idiot, a useless person. So, so you're, you're, you're right. I mean, perceptions do change. So, for example, in those first six, eight months, he never came and talked much to me, nor did he give me opportunities. Uh, Ram talked about opportunities. But suddenly, after realizing that, you know, I'm not that much of an idiot, when Manmohan Singh and Chidambaram were sort of, you know, sort of when... Uh, when we, the opening up of the economy was happening when PV Narasimha Rao and that time when they were going to, and uh, Manmohan Singh was going to be having a conference uh, in uh, New York. I was, this junior guy was asked to basically coordinate all of this from Citibank side. That's the opportunity I got over there to network with people in the, in the government, etc. So yeah, you're right. Perceptions do matter. And it's, and sometimes unconsciously you may, create this bad perception. I land, I for example, love wearing Churida Kurtas. And even when I'm in Chicago, I land up. So I found out many years later, people are wondering, who's this strange guy from India who lands up in his pajamas, in his, in his, in his pajamas to, for meetings? You know, so but that's, that's perception. I didn't realize that. So, uh, so it's important to, that perceptions also about you create or, or destroy some of the luck opportunities that you have. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so maybe, maybe yeah. So somebody would like, like to ask. We can take one quick question before we wrap up the session. So I want to talk about. If, if there's no one else, can I just sort of talk about an example of networking in the science and technology space? Yes, definitely. You can go ahead. Yes. So. So, so, so about a couple of years ago, maybe yeah, yeah, about that, uh, there was this uh, entrepreneur, a guy called Varun Agarwal, who approached us at CCS and said, I want to sort of figure out how we can improve policies in science and technology. And I did talk to Janadan also at that time. 
and uh, we decided to create this foundation for the advancement of science and technology and you know it's another example of a luck uh, networking etc because we had never thought about it at ccs the center for civil society varun had heard about the work that we do on policy initiatives and said okay why don't we why don't i work with ccs and fund them uh we reached out to various people to be on our advisory council one of them is the wife of one of our classmates uh, matthew's wife kagandeep khang we reached out we needed to get someone who would be a rich industrialist again i reached out to somebody who reached out to somebody else and chris gopala krishnan came on to our advisory board kiran mazumdar shah came on so it's that network again which created this opportunity for us in the science and technology space so similarly when prl would have been set up a long time ago he uh, i'm sure vikram sarabhai went to a lot of people in his network and you know and tried to get this thing set up and that's why we are all sitting over here celebrating 75 years of the physical research laboratory okay yeah so uh, since we have to wrap up by 5 so i think we will close this question and answer session and thank you. Uh, yeah uh, thank you very much luis for answering the uh, audience's uh, questions with so um, so nicely and uh, i would now like to invite durga prasad to conclude the session uh, you have to unmute yourself Uh, Durga, you're not audible. Your mic still shows. Yeah. okay uh, so since uh, th there seems to be some trouble so i will quickly uh, conclude this session so first of all i would like to thank luis for uh, giving such a nice talk on on the importance of uh, networking and uh, luck opportunities to in in getting successful in life and i don't think we could have a better person to talk about these things than him so uh, thank you very much and uh, also thanks for answering the question so nicely um yeah so now i would like to uh, thank uh, the director prl professor anil bhardwaj and also the committee members on prl kamrit vyakhyan uh, for organizing and successfully conducting the 51st episode of prl ka amrit vyakhyan and uh, this event is being organized as a part of PR, uh, azadi ka amrit mahotsav so do uh, do check all uh, prl social media accounts uh, for upcoming events uh, being held at prl especially prl ka amrit vyakhyan and we'll be looking forward to next week on wednesday at the same time for next episode for some interesting talk and with these words i would like to conclude this session thank you very much all thank you vinith and thank you for the opportunity to be here again thank you thank you very thank much sir thank you, thank you. Thank you, Luis. Thank you.